Good evening. Turn with me to Romans 11. We're going to read some uh, former ones here, 11 through 15. I say then, how... I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the, dis dismiss the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, exaltation, in other words, them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For as the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, that shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead. Lord, we thank you for everything, and we ask that you just come down and meet with us, Lord, and uh, minister to us. We so thank you. For your love and grace and we ask lord that you would be lifted up and glorified in so in every way possible and we just thank you for everything and we say this in your name amen you know it's amazing to me how god is remitting the spiritual slumber of the jewish people and he's doing it by provoking them to jealousy with the gentiles and you can hear that jealousy in them sometimes uh, in the Jewish realm towards Gentiles when they talk about well he's your Messiah uh, Jesus is your Messiah or we are also called or you know we start trying to identify with them through an inheritance and a legacy that has been passed down uh, through them from God and it is a real tough situation because, uh, you know, after all, in the name of Christ, many of them have been persecuted and killed. And so you have to understand some of their attitudes about it. But he's provoking them to jealousy. The nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, as we know. Uh, that was what the crucifixion was about. They cast him aside in order to have peace with the world, which at that time was Rome. Now we see that, that God wants to reconcile the world, Gentiles, to himself. And as a result, Israel had to be cast aside for that to happen. Now cast aside is for a season. Now I don't understand why that's so, but I know it's so because the Bible tells me. Perhaps it has to do with sharing their legacy or their inheritance. You can't, uh, as long as the main uh, one that's going to inherit things are standing in the way, you can't claim any inheritance. So the other one has to be moved out of the way so you can claim the inheritance. It's just the way it is. And so once everything is established, then the inheritance can be given to both. But as long as the Jews stood in the way as a na national Israel, the inheritance was theirs alone. And you have to understand that. And so does that have to do with what's going on as far as having them cast aside? And, and, and it comes down to, you have to realize that to step aside to embrace something that's foreign and contrary, which is what it would be to the Jews when it came to the Gentiles, would would never happen without some kind of preparation because the Jews would never accept it. They just won. And so there's a lot going on there. We don't understand it all, but the Bible tells us very clearly, number one, Israel has not been rejected. It has not been forsaken by God. It has just been cast aside for a season. And it's going to be so until he brings in the Gentiles who are heirs to salvation. Now, them being put over here opened the way for us to come in. And so when, uh, when people say, oh, well, we're 
replacing Israel as the church. I think, are you crazy? They were cast aside so we could be brought in, and eventually they're going to be brought forth again. Get past yourself. The Bible is very clear about that. Now you have to remember, once, once again, the Jews and Gentiles are saved the same way individually. We are talking about national Israel. We're not talking about all the Jewish people. We're talking about national Israel. God is not done with national Israel. And that's what this is all about. Now you have to remember, if it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you believe in your heart that he, God has raised Christ from the dead, you shall be saved as you confess Jesus is indeed Lord, the one that saves you. But when it comes to national Israel, that's something else. You have to realize that national Israel has been promised to be saved. They have that promise of salvation down the line as a nation. Now, of course, once you receive Christ, guess what? You're born again and you're part of that heavenly a family inheritance that is traced back to who? Israel. And all the promises given to Abraham, uh, some were given to uh, David, but all the promises were focused on Abraham and his descendants. Now God promises to Abraham that his descendants would make a great nation and that one day the Lord would rule over them. Now that we know that's true, it's coming in the millennium. He is going to rule over them in the millennium. Guess what? We're going to be in glorified bodies. It's nothing... The church is part of a kingdom, an unseen kingdom. Israel is a nation. It's a national entity of itself. And people don't seem to separate those two things. I'm glad to be part of the unseen kingdom. Because one day Christ is going to get me and I'm going to be part of that unseen kingdom. Ruling with him. Not down here, national Israel. Okay? I, I, I don't understand the thinking of some Christians. Uh, I, I don't want to stay here. I have so many other hopes and promises beyond this world. Why would I want to stay here? Why would I want to replace Israel? Well, yes, they have a national inheritance, but look at the heck they've gone through to have that national inheritance. We have to be honest. Now, they were promised that one day they would be the head instead of the tail. And that means the head over all. They would be unique in themselves. That is a promise that is not yet fulfilled. It will be. Now, after Babylon, the nation of Israel ceased to be national entity until 1948. They have been dispersed. They have been forgotten. They have been mocked. They have been everything. They've tried to destroy them. But you have to realize that God has been fulfilling the prophecy of gathering his people back into the land of Israel. We're watching that. And it started big time in 1948. Now the idea, the dream of it, was way before that. It was way before that. So is the nation of Israel asleep to their Messiah? Yes, they are. They are in under a spirit of slumber. And the reason they are is that the Gentiles can be reconciled back to God. That's the whole key. That God is now reconciling the world back to himself through Christ. But he's not done with Israel. We know that the Jew is being stirred up right now and guess what if you're asleep you have to be stirred up you have to be awakened you have to be provoked you have to be kicked you have to have a few other things happen to you and all of it so that in time they will turn back to their Messiah in repentance and we know a third of them will two-thirds will not so regardless of the heretical teaching, the church has not replaced Israel. 
And to believe so is a total mockery of what God has declared. It's a mockery. The church is heir through Christ, who was a Jew. All of that calling, uh, chosen, selected was about bringing forth the Messiah. So we need to remember that. Now it's through the Messiah the whole world has been enriched. We all have been enriched. If you're a Christian today, you've been enriched with salvation. It's been at the expense of the Jew. But I happen to know whatever you're willing to lose or give up for the Lord, a hundredfold will return to you. And that's what will happen to national Israel. Even though they have gone through all this so we can be rich, they in the end will be the most blessed nation. So that's part of their promise. You have to remember Jesus was a Jew, okay? In the end, they will, the national Israel will receive greater blessings as a nation. It's going to be the preferred nation of the world. There's not going to be all these Arabs and all these cabal and all these other people uh, playing this game to be world leader under Satan. Jesus is going to be that leader. So what about Christians? Okay, what do we need to understand about this? Let's get back to the promises regarding the nation of Israel. The first thing you have to know is they will be brought forth. Paul is declaring his lineage as a Jew in order to hopefully remind them his mission is to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. We talked about that jealousy last time. As, a, uh, as an apostle, he had authority. His calling was to the Gentiles and his mission to further the kingdom of God. Now, it was his hope. As a Jew, okay, he would awaken Jews. As an apostle, he would establish the authority behind his message. And the truth is, one has to be awakened to hear. They must trust what they hear in order to believe. They must be provoked at times to respond to the gospel message. Now, if you go into a place where the gospels preach, and the person's anointed and powerful, you're going to be provoked. I've seen it time and time again. When people go in there with the power of the Holy Spirit, they preach the pure gospel. It's not watered down. It's not adjusted. It's pure. The Holy Spirit is there. You're going to see the gospel provoke people. And you know what they're trying to do? Take that, that means of provoking out and make it comfortable. You take the power out of the gospel when you do that. What's the provoking? You're a sinner and you need to repent. That's what provokes people. That's what wakes them up. They don't want to hear that they're the sinner. They don't want to hear they're on their way to hell if they don't receive Christ. That provokes them, but that's the essence of the gospel. You are in trouble. You're dead in your sins. And the only one that can raise you up is the reality of what Christ did on the cross for you. Now, if the gospel was preached in that manner, it provokes people because they have to see their sin. They have to see they're in trouble. They have to see they're in danger, and they don't want to believe it. They don't want to believe it, and so they get angry about it. I'm telling you today, if you go in the church and they say they preach the gospel, but no one is provoked, either that church is totally asleep or the gospel's not being preached in power and authority. And remember, if the gospel's hidden, it's hidden to those who are lost. That's a frightening reality. So they're trying to provoke Israel. But they have to hear the message. In order to trust the message they hear, they have to be prepared to believe it for what it is. That's why we're saved by faith. Now, the gospel preaching power will provoke, it will challenge, it will awaken, it will rattle the rebellious, it will cause rage. I've seen it happen. 
One of, to me, one of the best preachers in my time was David Wilkerson. If anyone could provoke anybody, <laughs> he says, I want you either mad, mad or glad when you leave here. And that's how it should be. You should be mad or glad. You should never be comfortable. When I go to hear a preacher, I want to be challenged. I want to be made nervous in my state because I want to examine myself. I don't want to leave a church comfortable with myself because you can always come higher in Christ. And there's that provoking that needs to go on in the preaching. So we're getting down to some very simple truths, and we're going to look in verse 16 of chapter 11. And now we're getting into some basic realities that Paul's trying to bring out. For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now I want you to think about what he's saying here. Because most people say, why would God keep these rotten people, Israel? Why would he keep any of us? What he's saying right now is what? He's saying the first fruit be holy. Now, why is it holy? What's the lump here? It's Israel. The lump is holy. Why? Because the source is holy. Who's the source? God. So the lump is Israel. And because God's holy and has designated Israel, it's holy. It's considered holy. Now he goes on and he says, and if the root be holy, who's the root? It's Jesus. And so are the branches. Who are the branches? Gentiles. I want you to think about what it's saying here. You first have the source, God. You have the lump, Israel. Then you have the root, Jesus. And you have the branches, the Gentiles, the church. You have it all there. Why are we considered holy? Because the source is holy. God is holy. That's what uh, Paul's trying to get through the people. It's not that Israel stands holy. It's because their source is holy. And what does it make Israel? They're the first fruits. Now, a lot of people do not understand first fruits. But let me tell you what first fruits are. They were always dedicated to God. They were off the top. And they often represented the, the land, the fruit of the land. And they were called the meat offering. The meat offering, or meal offering, I should say, the meal offering was the most holy because it always had to do with God. God, you gave us this, we're offering it back to you. We are dedicating it back to you. All first fruits were dedicated back to God. So guess who else were the first fruits? The firstborn. Every firstborn son was considered the first fruits and automatically dedicated back to God. Who else were the first fruits? Every male animal was the first fruits. So all of that was automatically what? Dedicated back to God. It was all to be dedicated back to him. Now some of those first fruits were used in sacrifices. Most of them were. Especially when it came to the meal offering. But a lot of them were also used to feed the people of Israel. So they were used for sacrifice or they were used for feeding the priest, his family. So everything that was first fruits was dedicated back to God. So what does that tell you? Israel is considered the first fruit. What does that tell you? Israel is dedicated to God. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. It's that simple. I want you to think about this. What do you think the church is? It's the first fruits. What do you think you are as a believer? 
you're the first fruits. What does that tell you about your life? It's dedicated to God. It's not yours. It's not yours. And so you're not here to live your life. You're either be a sacrifice, and that's why, you know, Paul always said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. If, if you're the first fruits, that's the way it's supposed to be. You present yourself as a sacrifice, and maybe God will turn around and use his life to feed others. So this is a very important case that he's bringing out. Even though Israel may be a sinful nation right now, we talked about that, guess what? They're his first fruits. And their source is God. Therefore, they're considered holy. And that's true of the church today. We don't understand first fruits. You do a study on it, it's pretty incredible. You go back, you do a study on the first fruits. But anyway, we are the first fruits. And Paul's trying to get this in people's minds. Because Jesus is the vine, as that root goes back to holiness. So branches are considered holy, too. It's the source. It's the source. Who's your source? If God's your source, then you're considered holy. But your fruits are going to determine be determined by your relationship and your walk with God. So you have to keep that in mind. So he goes on and he says, and some of the branches be broken off. And thou being a wild olive tree. Now who is he talking about? To write? He's talking to the church. He's not talking to Israel. He's telling us something very important here. We've got to get it. He says, now some of the branches be broken off. There are branches that have been broken off, okay? In the Jewish, we're going to see uh, the Jews as being a tree, not branches. We've got to keep that very clear. They're an olive tree. We are branches out of a wild olive tree. You've got to keep that in mind, the old life, the old self. He says, so there are branches even from the natural olive tree that have been broken off. Yes, there is. He admits that. But you also have to remember something else. Working with trees and bushes, you have to prune them. We're going to get into that a little bit more. He goes on to say, and some of the branches be broken off. And now being a wild. Now listen to what he's talking about. He's talking about us. A wild olive tree. We're grafted in among them. In other words, yes, there are branches broken off. I don't know how many of you know what happens. But if you graft a branch in, you make a little slit in the actual tree. And it's a branch out of, you know, a certain tree. And then you stick it in there. And then you sort of tie it up a little bit, reinforce it so it can grow in there and the tree can grow around it. Now, I've, I've watched this with a tree before. Uh, we had a tree in uh, Nampa, beautiful tree. And one day, it starts splitting in half. I was so unhappy. So I asked people around me, what do you do with a tree that's splitting in half? They said, well, you get a big bolt, big enough to go through that tree. You drill a hole, you put that bolt through it, and you put a knot on it as close as you can. I said, but, I said, won't it kill the tree? No, the tree will embrace it, and eventually it will cover it up, and you won't even know it's there. And that's what happened. And that's what the uniqueness of a tree is. It will take that, even the most foreign object, and it will embrace it. And it will make it part of it. And that's what, uh, you know, it does when it comes to branches. And so he's saying, you are out of a wild olive tree. You're out of this world. You're out of what's old. And you, you've been taken out of that wild olive tree because of salvation. And I'm, 
he made a split there in that tree, that natural tree of promise, of inheritance, of legacy, because that's what's attached to Israel, and he's grafted you in. Now, this is what the whole thing is about. He's grafted you in. Now you're part of the promise. Now you're part of the inheritance. And, of course, that tree embraces you. It goes on, we're grafting among them with, with them that partake us of the root. You're now going to partake of the benefit of the root, which is holy, and the fatness of the olive tree. Now, fatness points to anointing, oil of that tree. But the problem is we have people running around now, well, ah, the church has replaced Israel. It's we have all the promises. Oh, aren't we wonderful? We got it, and they're stupid. No, they're blinded for our sakes. National Israel has been blinded for our sake so that we can be reconciled to him. And that's why Paul makes the next statement. Look at what he says. He says, boast not against the branches. Don't boast against those branches, the Jewish people that have been cut off, don't boast. We're here, you're not. Don't even go there with your arrogance. Why? Now look at what it says. Boast not against the branches that have been broken, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. What is really holding you to the promises of God, yourself or Jesus? It's the root that's bearing you up and giving you life, you're not giving any, any resources to that root. And that's why he's trying to get, it's called grace. It's called grace here. And so he's laying it out, and he goes on, he says, Thou will say that branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That is not true. That's not true. Now, Israel is being pruned. Let me say that. And I'm, I have to admit, there doesn't seem like there's much left of Israel. But I want you to know the tree's still there. The branches may have been cut back a lot. And sometimes you have to cut back in order to save the tree. And yes, the branches have been cut back much. Some are totally not there anymore. They've been totally cut off. But what you need to understand is that the source is still there, the root is still there, the tree is still there. And that God is going to bring it back. They were not broken off so that we could be engrafted in them. We need to get a reality check. We are the first fruits of a kingdom. Israel is the first fruits of a nation. There's a difference. That nation is still alive and well. We are part of an unseen kingdom. That's what we are. What do we need to understand? We are the first fruits of the Spirit. We are the first fruits of the Spirit. That is what Romans 8.23 tells us. James 1.18 says, We have been begotten by the word of truth that we should be, the, be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We are the first fruits too. Do we get boastful? Do we get arrogant? No, we don't. We are part of the first harvest. I want you to know that the first harvest has been going on for 2,000 years. Get over yourself. We have all been part of that first harvest. We're part of the first fruits of the Spirit. If you're born again, you have been born into a whole new kingdom. 
you're the first to be born in that kingdom as far as God is concerned. You are dedicated to him. Now, where our lives will be either offered up as a sweet fragrance, which some was, or poured out to others to feed comes back to what God wants to do with us. But understand, a branch is broken off for a reason. A branch just doesn't break off. It's broken off because there's a weakness there. And let me tell you the one thing that will cause weakness in your relationship with God, no matter where you're at, no matter how religious you are, and Paul brings it out in verse 20. Okay? Let's look at 19. It says, First thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And then he explains, Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. He says because they did not believe, they were broken off. I want you to know because people don't believe, they're broken off. And this is why Paul reminds the Romans, and thou standest by what? By faith. You stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. He's warning these arrogant Christians, oh, well, hey, look at us. We're God's special little creatures. No, you're not. You are part of something great and incredible. But so is everyone else who's part of that. Be not high-minded. Another word for this is be not conceited, but fear. Walk in the fear of the Lord. That's where your wisdom is going to be. It's not your knowledge, it's that you fear God, you have a healthy fear, you don't want to dread, you dread not pleasing him, because we can only please him by faith. That's what the Bible says, Hebrews eleven six. 6, if you want to read that. You can't please God without faith. And so, don't be high-minded, but fear and then he tells you why in verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, meaning Israel, take heed, lest he also spare not you or thee. He said, I don't have to spare you either. I don't have to spare you either. You have to realize that once a branch is broken off, guess what? It's worthless. It cannot produce any fruit. Why are you here? Oh, to live my life. Why are you here? Well, you know, to go to church, do some good things. With my... No, you're here to bear fruit. That's what you're here to do. You're here to bear fruit. That's why Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. They're either barren it or they're not. You can't fake it. It doesn't matter how religious you talk. It doesn't matter how high-minded you are about what you know. It doesn't matter what's your fruit. And that's what Paul's bringing out here. In John 15, 2, it says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Isn't that what he says? It's about fruit bearing. He taketh away. If you don't bear fruit, he takes you away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he, he purges it. In other words, he's going to prune you. That you may bring forth more fruit. John 15, 6 goes on to say, If a man abideth not in me, you have to be in him. You have to abide in him. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. It's laying it all out there for us. We're, we're attached to the vine by faith. We stand by faith. We abide by faith. It's all a matter of grace. But nevertheless, it's there. And that fruit is going to come from the root. 
which is Christ. And when people taste it, they're going to know it. They're going to know it. So we're told that it all comes down to our fruit. The fruit being produced in our life. That's what people are tasting. What is exalted at such times is our perception how we think things are. Rather than our character. What does your character tell you? What is character? It's your integrity. It's your thinking. Are you being honest? Are you being pure? Are you looking at things from God's perspective? Are you holding yourself to that high accountability? Are you saying you have rights? And that I can, I can think this way even though the Bible says different. I can be this way even though the Bible says different. I can have my own creed even though the Bible says different. No, you are a person that is disconnected by unbelief. Because faith believes, faith obeys, faith walks in, in it, faith walks out of it. Faith possesses the promises. And so Paul is really trying to get a hold of people. See, many people lack fear of God. If you lack fear of God, you lack wisdom. And you're going to be played as a fool in the end. The Bible says when you think you stand, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 12, you want, if you think you stand, you're about ready to fall. Now, Paul is clearly bringing sobriety to this subject. He's trying to knock the nonsense out of us and cause us to realize our position and the seriousness of our position and the type of attitude we need to have, not only towards Jewish people, but our own walk in Christ, our own life in Christ. He's really trying to get it in us. Now look at verse 21. He says, For if God fared, spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Now we could read that a lot, and I think we need to. He says, take heed. Because if God didn't spare the natural branches, which he has ordained, which he cultivated, you have to understand, he raised up Israel. He brought Israel out of nothing. He cultivated this nation. He nurtured this nation. He called this nation. He chose this nation. He selected this nation for the Messiah. He did all of that. He called. He did all of that. And yet there were branches that were broken off because of unbelief. He kept the lump, but there were a lot of branches broken off. And he says if he didn't spare the branches, he spared the lump because of his promises. But if he didn't spare the branches, all the branches, who do you think you are that think he can spare you? Now he won't... He, he will somehow spare you from paying the consequences down the line. It's not true. He's, Paul's bringing sobriety to this subject. Look, we can hide behind God's love and grace. All we want, and that's what I hear. Oh, God loves me. Oh, God's grace. But I'm going to tell you something. What it's going to come down to is the fruits in your life. That's what it's going to come down to. How do they taste? You see, the goodness of God is sweet. How does your fruit taste? Is it sour? Because there's inconsistency. Is it bitter? Because there's bitterness in you. Is what? What does he? What's, what does he taste? What do others taste? when they partake of your life. We need to remember that God is not a respected person. He will not spare Israel from tasting the bitterness of foolishness and rebellion, and he will not spare those of the church. 
The question is, why would he spare the lifeless branches of the church? Those unproductive branches. Why would he spare them when he clearly established that they would be judged? Why would he spare them? Now, look, we can hide behind God's love and, and his grace, but the test comes down to whether our lives are showing forth the fruit of the Spirit. It's that simple. After all, we as believers are the first fruits of the great harvest taking place in this world. Every one of us are the first fruits of that great harvest. And the reason you're sitting here is not because you're wise and smart, is because God went after you. And as the husband, just like Israel, he established you, he nurtured you, he cultivated you so that he can bring you forth for his glory. And out of that, you will produce wondrous fruits that bring him glory. And that's what it comes down to. And Paul is trying to really establish that fact in Romans, to the Romans. And today, the church needs to get that fact too.